<laughs> well, man, I, I have really, really missed you guys. It's so great to see you. Boach, Buddy, Doc, Blummer, Swain. How, you, how are you guys doing? We're doing well. I'm doing great. It's good to see these guys again. I've seen, I see them occasionally, Doc and Buddy and Swain. Blummer, I haven't seen in a while, but... Uh, you know, like like everybody, you know, just hunkering down, waiting uh, to get through this. Now, let me ask you this question. If, if right now, you guys have been hunkered down with your families, quarantining for about a month. If I said right now, the honeydews are over, no more self-quarantine, you can go quarantine with your respective teams for a month, for a couple months at La Quinta Inn in Peoria. How many of you guys <laughs> sign up for that right now? How many of you guys are ready to just get going? Well, I... Marty, I think we're all ready to get going, right? I think we're all, uh, yeah, I think we're all anticipating to get going. I think that's probably uh, the best way to put it. I think, uh, I think we all see an end game here. We don't know when, though, right? I think guys, uh, we're all anticipating that. Uh, the I know from what everybody's heard, yeah. uh, Mar, and uh, it'll happen at some point. Uh, How about you, Doc? I think, I think yeah. I'm. Yeah, I don't know about the, the two-month quarantine, um, but I'm ready to get going. Um, I'm still hopeful that we have baseball. Um, I think for all of us, it's kind of the sitting and waiting. Um, but, you know, talking to all the guys, you know, sharing TikToks, uh, watching guys get creative <laughs> on their workouts at home. Uh -huh. uh, but, again, I'm, I'm hopeful for baseball. Uh, we just celebrated – uh, virtually uh, Boach's birthday, so that was that was a good one. How did you do that special TikTok video for Boach? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't give him a special. I'm going to give him once I can see him <laughs> up close personally. Then I'll give him my own one-on-one -on -one personal TikTok. I I'm looking forward to that, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys all staying sane at home? Lummer. Yeah, you you have the, you have four your wife the, your four daughters yeah. triplets. Uh, well, yeah, and it, it's great seeing everybody too. By the way, I I know that you know I moved out here three years ago, and I'm in Houston, so things have definitely changed for me a little bit. And it's always good to see some friendly faces. And uh, Bo, I just I want to give Bochi credit uh, for picking a hell of a year to, uh, bail out of this situation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get, you get a golf clap on the genius move getting out of this situation, but, uh, it's, it's been interesting. You, everybody knows that, uh, my triplets now are not, uh, little kids anymore. They're uh, freshmen in high school. My oldest is driving a car and driving us crazy all at the same time because, uh, you know, the, the social atmosphere is not as cool at home with the family as it should be but uh, i've got both my floaties on as i'm drifting and staying afloat in the estrogen ocean i'm living in right now <laughs> <laughs> nice that's awesome uh, I, i'll go next marty uh, yeah. the the best thing is this used to be all southern california guys and blummer messed it up he ended up going to houston i don't understand that but um we'll we'll digress from that because we love you blummer especially yeah. your hair done um, you know what, for me, it's, it's really about everyone else. We've sat back and thought about baseball. We've thought about so many things. Um, it's about so many people that are helping out in a tough situation, but also hunkering down with your family, uh, enjoying some of the things like, a, uh, my stepdaughters, 19 and 16, uh, mm -hmm. we're spending a lot of time with them and it's quality time. And it's something that you can dive into. The challenge is, I tell you what, uh, I have an eight-year-old and I have to homeschool him. And I never was great in school, let's put it that way. Uh, but I, I'm, really tr I'm really struggling with the new math concepts that we're trying to teach an eight-year-old. It's killing me. Oh, man. Yeah, wait till you get to fractions, man. Then, I, then you, you might be, uh, it might be over you once you yeah, get to fractions. I'm out. I'm out. Oh man, I'm with you. Those things are terrible. Remember the denominator? You got to flip the denominator when you divide. Then you can then you can multiply. Well, I'm gonna call you, Doc, for that. <laughs> Doc, you can go right into the Dodger analytic department. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely not smart enough for that. Doc, okay. How? You, what books do you have behind you on that shelf? And how many of those? I have no idea. Have <laughs> so first of all. Yeah, the, the the baby blue and white kind of motif behind is certainly not my doing. Um, 
Let me see. I don't think I recognize a book. There's a dream golf book right here. That's a golf book. <laughs> Haven't read it. Um, yeah. Marty? Mm. I haven't read any of them. Hey, look, how do they look? How do they look on uh, on the Zoom? Oh, you look so <laughs> smart. I mean, Very clearly, official. clearly yeah, you're the smartest right. guy in this panel because you are the only one there with <laughs> so much books behind you right now. And then my, my daughter's got a book here. I can't hurt, for, it can't hurt forever. So that's here. So, yeah. Um, but I am reading a good book right now. I'll tell you this. I'm reading a good book called uh, Chop Wood carry water and it's kind of a uh eastern uh eastern europe eastern eastern kind of thought um kind of simple simplifying things positive one step at a time living in the present so um i think that as swain said people are helping people this kind of a time i think that you can be a little bit more introspective and i do think the world's going to be different as we get to the other side of this and so kind of looking at ways that i can constantly try to grow and, and get better that's all. This is such a unique opportunity because I have three former Padres managers here on the same panel. Doc, you had that. I think you were in a room for like a day or something like that. But, but still. It wasn't a good day. We got routed by the A's. <laughs> Oakland A's, that's right. But Doc. Coach, uh, Black yeah. gave me the ambush, uh, ambush uh, <laughs> managing job. <laughs> <laughs> what's the relationship like? I mean, you guys are all here, but what's the relationship with, with Doc, Boach, and Buddy? Just a, such a unique thing to have you guys all here and both you were all in the same division or you were. Boach, you go first. Uh, oh. Boach, you're, you're the senior. senior you're member. the oldest. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm different than the rest of them because, you know, I, I don't have a job. So <laughs> all the comments they were making, I, this is probably close to what I would be doing if we didn't have this. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Doc and I, you know, Doc played for me here in San Diego. I brought him up to San Francisco swings I had uh, and Buddy and I have been managing against each other being in division and we you know we have some uh, events that uh, we have spent together in fact he carried me in a golf tournament one time to help make me some money uh, but uh, no it's a great relationship and that, and we appreciate you know uh, the battles that, that we've had on the field and uh, and that's what I'm going to miss but uh, no I couldn't uh, you know could be happier for uh, you know how these guys have done it, yeah. You know, and their careers, whatever. But for me, uh, you know, this is a step back time. I'm enjoying it. It's good to see Blummer. And, uh, and, and, and I'll get a little, uh, uh, real quick before I, I let you go, uh, uh, before I let them go. You know, I was, on t I was watching TV last night and I saw the first game of the Astros and uh, the Padres in 98 when Brown and Johnson hooked together. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, being back on the field. That, that was such a, a beautiful game, mm -hmm. what Brown did, and a great start mm -hmm. for us. So that's what I'm, I'm enjoying, whatever. But, you know, with these guys I spend time with, we have a trip in Jackson Hole. We go up there together. We've wow. done uh, Zoom times. And, uh, you know, i got some stories. I, don't, I wish I could tell you. Oh, no, no. Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, let's go. This is the perfect time. Let's hear those stories. Let's go. Don't talk. Don't talk about jumping off uh, off off of bars and sushi restaurants, Boach. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know Doc uh, was that, that athletic, but you know. Hey, you're not supposed to say names. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we um, won't talk, we won't talk about Doc peddling his wine opening day in St. Louis in two uh, I don't know, 2012 or 13. I loved it. Uh, that's where Red Stitch got started, I think, Doc. That's where it's got its legs. That was a late night, Blackie, going into opening day. Yeah, um, at, at Shannon's restaurant, I think that's where Red Stitch. That's where it was born. <laughs> Red Stitch was born in St. Louis at Shannon's, Mike Shannon's restaurant. I love it. Um, I think for, for me, it's like there's so many, like, seeing Blummer. I haven't seen Blummer in so long, and, and it's so many of us that, either play together on staffs together, played for, you know, guys and, um, and so many people that have been through San Diego in some capacity. It's interesting how we all have that bond and some guys uh, have moved back at the end of their careers. And um, some guys were here and moved elsewhere like Blummer, but we always kind of keep track of each other. And I think that's, that's the cool thing where this is a chance where we can sort of reset and get reconnected a little bit. I love the whole storytelling thing. And if I have this right, Boach, you were the manager when Blum was traded to the White Sox, correct? 
So yeah, what? What? In yeah, 05, what was that? that was 2005 when Corey, his beautiful yeah. wife, was pregnant with the triplets, had the triplet girls. Right. What was that conversation like? I'm not sure if it was you or KT, but when you tell Jeff Blum, listen, you, you've just become the new father of triplets. By the way, we're trading you across the country to the Chicago, Chicago <laughs> White Sox. How'd that conversation go down, if you can recall, from, from both? Yeah, I, I think I'll speak for all the managers here. That's, that's the toughest part of our job. It's better than a release, trust me, but uh, even a trade is difficult, uh, yeah. especially, you know, when they're anchored here, their family's anchored here in San Diego, and uh, and I'm sure, I'm guessing Blummer loved playing here in San Diego. I mean, what a great city. And, uh, and you know, say, hey, you're going to the White Sox, you know, that could have been the greatest news. Maybe it was. He's getting away from me. <laughs> and he got a ring. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a ring, but uh, at the time, you know, it's it's a little devastating uh, or, you know, it can be emotional for the players. So for the man the manager, it is too, because, you know, they're they're like your boys, you know, you, you get attached to them and you care about them. Hopefully they know that, and, but it's never an easy time. No, Bo, Bo, Bo channeled it great. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was a unique situation being able to play in San Diego while my wife was pregnant just up the road. And then the girls are born, you know, that whole process. And then uh, the thing that was crazy to me is that I got traded from a first place team to a first place team. I don't know how often that actually happens. And then, uh, so it was kind of nice at the end of the year to get two uh, bonus checks from the playoffs, which was kind of cool <laughs> and, and really helped out the, uh, the, the efforts as far as having three kids instantly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, to Kevin's, you know, KT's, uh, credit and Boach's credit. Boach, uh, he may not, he's been, he's been around baseball for so long. He's got so many stories, but I remember going into his office, uh, you know, Fred Yulman tapped me on the shoulder, brought me into Boach's office and KT sitting on the couch. And I come in and Boach literally has his head in his hands. And I was like, Oh God, what happened? You know? And then he, you know, he lets me know I got traded. And uh, to Kevin's credit also is when I was in there uh, kind of absorbing the information Kevin looked at me and goes, I understand you're on a one-year contract. He goes, you'll be the first phone call I make after the season's over. Mm. Best of luck. And guess what happened? I think the first day of signing after the World Series was over, Kevin gave me a call and I was a Padre again. I was eternally grateful for that. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Mm. That's Kevin. Kevin cares. And Kevin really, Absolutely. Liked, really liked you a lot, Blummer. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good story. And, uh, I've seen that more than once from Kevin. Yeah. Well, that's the reason I got to San Diego. I remember going to uh, being in Boston and getting traded from a first place team in LA to a second place team in Boston. And uh, my wife was eight months pregnant. And so I was bummed to be going to the East Coast. And um, so I got there and the season ends. And uh, I remember being at Robin Ventura's uh, retirement party up in Paso Robles and KT uh, and Theo Epstein at the time were trying to get me over there. And Theo, to his credit, whose pedigree from KT, uh, a men mentee of his, said that, hey, um, I want you to come back to Boston, but I know you want to go to San Diego. I'm going to do everything I can. So they grinded and worked something out. So KT basically took less or gave up more to get me to San Diego and so for Theo to uh, appease me and my family going forward to play every day, and then for, uh, for that, I owe KT and Theo a lot for that. Two more questions that I have, and then you guys can go ahead and do whatever, um, have your own conversation. But um, the most challenge, it's easy to talk about the best player you ever played with or managed. Who was the most challenging player you were either teammates with or managed? Nah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I was gonna say Doc or maybe Sean Casey. Those two guys really stick out in my mind. They were trying to win the nicest Player of the Year award every single year. Both of those guys, That's so it just reward? became a, a a big challenge. That's oh right. yeah, right. of course it is. Uh, my my toughest was uh, I didn't really have any tough teammates. I, I had really good teammates. Um, I would say a guy that's a free agent right now is probably the toughest guy that I had to manage. Um, he's not from our country, but I still yeah. love him. I love him to death, <laughs> okay. but man, he, he's a tough one. Okay. Buddy? Uh, 
I'm trying. I'm trying to think. We. Milton Bradley. Uh, no, he, he's trying to figure out how to word it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. No, actually, hey, actually, Milton was great. Really. And, and, oh yeah. I mean, you know, he came to us uh, if you remember mid-season, and uh, I mean, he played great. I mean, he played great for us. Yeah. And actually, I. You know, if you uh, you know if you guys remember, we were we were on our way. The Rockies were doing incredible stuff there in in 07, winning 21 out of 22 at the end. But you know, with the with the week to go, Milton and I had a little. Uh, we had a situation at first base with the first base umpire and Mike Winters. Uh, you know, it just I, and I, <laughs> I don't know whether I tore his ACL or not, but. Uh, <laughs> he took him down. He went down and, and killed us. I mean, uh, you know, on the, on the on the same on the same on the same uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, if you remember, Mike Cameron uh, got injured in the outfield, and Milton tore his ACL. So we lost two of our best players in one day with a week to go. I mean, I, I yeah. but, but actually, Milton was great. Uh, I mean, I would, you know, I you know I. I, Marty, he ducked that one pretty well, didn't he? Yeah. He did. That was. <laughs> I, had, I had great coaches to take care of the bad guys. That Mark. was phenomenal bad. non-answer. Like I have like a couple. There's a couple masters here of not answering the question but giving a long, interesting answer. Oh, I got, so, hey, let me, I'll tell you a quick Blummer story. This is like my first <laughs> first month first month managing. There we go. First month managing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm replacing Boach, and I'm trying to do all the right things and take care of veteran players. Yeah. And uh, we had a we had a we had a day game after a night game or something, and uh, I was gonna tell Blummer that you know he wasn't playing the next day, mm. and I told Marcus Giles prior to that that he was playing. So I went up to Marcus and said, "Hey man, you're in there tomorrow. Blummer's not gonna play." So I had to talk to the press or something. I went back in the clubhouse and I went to Blummer and say, hey, Blummer, man, hey, listen, you're not uh, you're not in there tomorrow. He goes, I know. Marcus already told me. <laughs> 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 so man, player talk it was great. So I sort of figured out that you know if I I knew how to manage a little bit of the players, they'll they'll get the word around. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was great. He goes, I already know. Marcus told me. <laughs> yeah, we had the inside scoop. Yeah, we we were a pretty good platoon together. We had each other's back. No one who, no one the, uh, the 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 festivities maybe the night before. He gave me the heads up. Yeah. So far, I've gotten two no no answers. All right, next. <laughs> Blummer. Um, man, if I mean, uh, can I just say Brett Myers was interesting as a teammate, to say the least. Interesting works. Okay. Worse. It was it was weird. It was it was some awkward situations I was in that I just did. It, you know, it was the landing at four o'clock in the morning and getting into the parking garage at Minute Maid Park, and it's it's totally enclosed. And he had it was like when uh, the first Dodge Charger came out or something, whatever it was, Super Sport, and he obviously had fourteen exhaust pipes on the back of this thing, and we're we're how you know. Uh, tired, get in late, looking to get in our cars, and he's in there doing donuts and you know burning out. And he was just uncle. Uh, it, was, it was a it was a little much. <laughs> I got one. I got one story that Boach might remember, and it was after '98 because I think it's relevant. They're playing the games now, uh, but we had an interesting character named Randy Myers, who uh, really was uh, when he, he he came in, and it was uh, we had a close knit locker room and he came in and it just got a little strange let's put it that way not a bad guy just you didn't know what was coming out so I think Boach put him into a game and we were in Arizona I remember this we're in Arizona and Boach you probably remember this more than more than I do but the particulars were he faced a right-hander and it was a close game and he gave up a home run to this guy that was off the bench and all of a sudden uh Dave Stewart goes out to talk to him. He comes back in, and he says he told me that he envisioned uh, Chipper Jones up with the bases loaded, and he wanted to switch him around, but he wanted to throw a particular pitch. But it, unfortunately, it wasn't Chipper Jones. It was a guy that hit a ball out, and we ended up losing. And we were struggling at the time. We were trying to get into the playoffs, 
and it was getting ugly. But, Coach, you probably remember that scenario better than I do. But it just added to the element of Randy Myers. <laughs> you know, do I remember it? Randy, I mean, you, you're, you described him, I mean, right on. I mean, he, he was just – he, he, he was just different, you know, and not in a bad, bad way, but uh, yeah. you know, that incident you're talking about, he comes to my office, he goes, hey, Skip, you know, this no doubles thing, you know, he gave up the home run, he goes, you know, when you put him in a no doubles thing, they're just going to try to hit it farther off me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that was his response, like it was my fault, but then he would have maybe hit one over their heads, but not over the fence. <laughs> but also in the World Series, uh, you know, he, he was a competitor, but his stuff, you know, he had a torn uh, rotator and he wasn't owning up to it. Tough guy, real tough guy. And Langston gave up that home run that we all know about. And he came in, I wasn't in the mood for it at the time. It was right after the game. <laughs> he comes in and goes, hey, Skip, you know, that's why you had me here. And, you know, we had some words in, whatever, but. Uh, he was just trying to instill some confidence in himself, I guess. But you know, you you, you have those. I mean, they're they're all they're interesting uh, personality that you come across. But Randy's up there with he's at the top of my list. Didn't he bring like grenades to the ballpark, or just something weird? Grenades, <laughs> yeah, he's different. He, yeah, but uh, you know what? It is the son of a gun and poor KT. You know, we picked him up on the, on the waiver swings, if you remember. Yeah. yeah. And he was with Toronto, and the only team was the Braves. So Kevin thought the Braves were looking for a left-hander, nullify our left-handed bats that we had. So he claimed them. And um, it was, I think, Gord Ash, uh, he said, gosh, Kevin, I hate to tell you this, but you got him. And he had a pretty good contract going. He had like yeah. 12 or 13 million. But thank goodness, and Fred Yolman Jr. is the one that, that handled this, but he had insurance on the rest of that contract. Because the next spring, I mean, he's throwing like 82. And Randy was a power arm. Back with the Reds, yeah. nobody was up. And so uh, I think we recovered some of that money. But uh, he still wanted to pitch. I give him credit. He still wanted to be out on the mound. Okay. The one guy, I think all of you have either played with or managed Khalil Green at some point, except for except for Buddy. Does anybody know where Khalil Green is today? And it, does anybody have a favorite Khalil Green story that has not been previously told? <laughs> oh, it's probably, well, it's probably been told. Okay. Um, I, this was shocking because it was at Qualcomm. Um, he was incredible shortstop, yeah. as we all know, just very athletic. And this is when uh, uh, Boach was managing. And he made uh, – he didn't make a play at short that cost us uh, a big part of the game. Obviously, it didn't cost us the game. But um, so after the game, we're just depressed and guys filter into the, the weight room. And I go into the weight room, and he's in his socks, full uni, in his socks and he's over in the mirror uh, doing footwork. And I walk over um, because he was doing a twirling position and make it, you might remember this plumber because he, he, he does a backhand and he starts turning around and acting like he's throwing. I said, you all right? And you know, you never knew what you were getting with Khalil. <laughs> I mean, it, so he looks at me with like his Twizzler haircut that he had you know, straight down the middle. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, man, uh, I missed that play. And I, I had the wrong footwork in mind. That's why I missed it. And it clanked off my hand. And I want to get it right. And I said, wow, that's, to me, that's next level of, of how he thought of the position. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, Khalil expected a lot out of himself. And, yeah. and we always saw how great he was. But man, he was the, the, the quiet assassin. Because man, could he play the game of baseball. It just wish he he had that mental capacity to go further in his career because he was spectacular. I'm a, I'm in the same boat as Sween because I, I would take ground balls at shortstop just to be next to Khalil when he was taking them because to Sween's point, you know he would be in the mirror watching the footwork and seeing how his body moved. This guy was one of the few shortstops that actually understood how to get his body in position to make plays across the diamond. And he would literally take that in there and do it during batting practice 
And probably one of the funnier things was probably watching me trying to emulate what he was trying to, what he was actually <laughs> accomplishing. But uh, I remember a conversation vividly. It was, he was getting later, or he was getting closer to free agency. So he was later in that uh, arbitration, you know, situation. And uh, I said, Khalil, I go, what's the plan, man? What do you got moving forward? How long are you going to play in the league? You know, you're doing great. You're putting up phenomenal numbers at shortstop. You're due for a great big payday. And he kind of looks at me and goes, what? I'm, I'm a two-year deal and a good drum beat away from retiring. Wow. Because that dude, I don't know if you remember the swing. He would literally, he was the M&M of our, of the of baseball. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He rap. had napkins. Yeah, he had napkins. He'd be writing lyrics on the bus, on the plane, and he loved music. So my, my hope is that he's somewhere, yeah. maybe buried in, a, you know, a DJ booth in South <laughs> Carolina, just throwing out some <laughs> yeah. uh, beats and rhymes. <laughs> wow. Okay, my last question, and thank you all so much for your time. Um, either from all of you, I either want your best headliner impression or your oh. best headliner story. I know you. each of you have one. Absolutely. Let's go. Let's hear it. Well, all you got to start with is, oh, my Padres. <laughs> and you know, away you go. Everything else is, is real. Um, I, I don't, you know what, I, I think that, you know what, I, I think that, uh, Teddy for me, I, I think Boach and, and Blackie, Swains, you know, you guys have some stories, Blummer. I think for me, it was just the way he called me Davey and he was always sort of exasperated, but always hanging on for some, looking for a glimmer of positivity, but the deep breath, the sigh, and, but yeah, how about my Padres, or, you know, it's just, this guy just loved San Diego so much, you know, and I think that for me, um, when I'm grinding, playing, and uh, Teddy comes down, kind of disheveled with his hair, you know, the collared shirt, the, the, yeah. the pod shirt, kind of, in, out, it's kind of the collar might be up, might be down. But man, he's always put his arm around me and told me how much how much he loved me and I uh, love the pods. No, I think that's the thing what Dave is saying. He came down and if you saw him coming at you, you didn't know what to expect. But as soon as he opened his mouth, you knew he was in the best mood ever because you had that Padre uniform on. Yeah. You know, but you never knew he'd come at you and you were right about the hair and the shirt and everything flying everywhere. And then he Bummer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he he was always a good time, man. He was a great conversation. Tough to get out of sometimes, but a good conversation. I can't remember what year it was, but you know Teddy was doing he's you know doing Aztec football, mm -hmm. and Jerry was not uh, Jerry was not with us. So Teddy was this was late in the year, and we were back east somewhere. So uh, so the so the. So the pregame show with with uh, Ted and I was, you know, before uh, obviously, but you know, before a game we had to tape it. So uh, I knew that the Aztecs were playing on a Saturday night, and we were back east somewhere. So I'm expecting somebody else to do the pregame show, uh, you know, three hour time change wherever we were. And uh, here we are. It might have been New York. I think uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's, you know, 1130, you know, for a one o'clock game, 12, you know, 12 o'clock, whatever. Uh, Teddy, Teddy comes into the, into my office and says, Hey, you ready for the pregame? I go, what are you doing here? Are you kidding me? You had you called the Aztec game last night. What are you doing here? He goes, I got on the red eye and I, I got here. I got to, you know, I got to yeah. do my job. I go, are you shitting me? <laughs> but that, that's uh, what he does, right? I mean, he did a, he called an Aztec game on Saturday night at the stadium, got yeah. on a plane at midnight or whatever, and got to New York. And I think it might have been getaway day, you know, for, for us to come back come back west. And he, he was there to call the call our 1 o'clock game back east. Of course. So uh, he loves what he does. And to Doc's point, he loves all of us. I mean, there's not – there's not a guy, especially a long-term Padre or anybody who's at, who's had impact on the Padre that he doesn't love. And he, and he, and he just, 
relishes and cherishes and loves all of us, which is so cool. I love that about Teddy. Well, I'm looking for I'm looking forward to your story, but I know you must have an impression. You have to. You have to. No, you know he he talks too fast for me to to do any kind of explanation. But you know I I I mean I saw this man and he, I, I love him to death. I, I saw him make such a transformation back when I played. You know in the early '80s. I mean Ted Leitner was Mr. San Diego. Yeah. He owned this town. He. He was doing the news, I mean, baseball in the news, and uh, he was tough. I mean, the players were even a little afraid of him, to be honest, because he, he, really? he didn't hesitate to rip everybody. I mean, you know, we weren't <laughs> the smartest people on earth or whatever, and that, that was kind of his stick. And then he went the other way when he became the announcer for uh, Padres and loved everybody. And as Swings mentioned, uh, he had so much respect for the colonel and what he did in the military, everything about him. But uh, – um, he just loved. He just loved his team. Uh, he was behind them. Uh, uh, the thing about, I love about Ted is, uh, you know, he, he's he's not. He he tells stories about the the players, the game. He's not, you know, talking about their stats or whatever. He he just he's got a, a spot in his heart for everybody, and uh, and it shows every time. Or showed every time when I came to San Diego or even San Francisco, he come out on the field. To say hello, and he folks, folks, folks. I got to tell you, folks. You know, and you know how fast he talks, and he he start going, and uh, and then he was you know on a roll there. But uh, I I I love the man, and uh, he's done so much here in San Diego, and and uh, became such a, a, a beautiful um, guy for uh, San Diego. He, he is a, to me. He's still like when when I think of uh, San Diego Padres, you can't help but Ted Lightner. Yeah. Uh, with the Padres. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, I cannot thank you enough for your time. It's been awesome. But uh, the people that are going to watch this later on, um, if I don't ask you, each of you, what you're drinking, I, I will get crushed. So if you don't mind, just we'll go around. What's, 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 what's uh, your social sparkler? We're going to start with Boach. Yeah, I'll start with Boach. Um, I'm having a little uh, Weller bourbon. Yeah, just a little bit on the rocks before I go and have dinner. Nice. I figured Doc was here. I, you know, if I'm around Doc, I have to have a little bourbon. That's right. That's right. I went, um, I'm, I'm starting with a vodka tonic and then I'm going to go with my, uh, with my red wine later. Would that be red stitch? No. Oh, really? Okay. All no, right. no red stitch tonight. Okay. Okay. Uh, Buddy? Well, I'm having a uh, old beer. I'm having a, a beer that I haven't had before. It's a, a, a Thorn IPA, a Thorn Brewing Company beer here in Delicious. San Diego. Uh, it's, it's super cold. Uh, before I have a little dinner here shortly with, uh, I'm over at my daughter's house. Uh, both daughters are here. Uh, so we're going to have a, we're going to have a little meal. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sween? I used to have brutal margaritas until I got next to Xavier Nady and he upped my game to, uh, using yes. good to good tequila in the in the margarita, and he actually made it where it was not too sweet. So, cheers to X Man because uh, this is the reason why. Cheers. Nice. Hey, sorry, right. real quick, real yeah. quick. What's uh, I mean, what's in your margarita? How how do you make it? So how he does it, he goes. Uh, I mean, you can heavy pour the tequila, and then he has a little bit of agave. Uh, fresh lime juice, and then you put a little bit of Grand Maillet in, and then he adds water to kind of dilute the, the tart of the lime. And it's, I, I like it. I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. So, X Men, thank you. Nice. Blummer, what are you going with? <laughs> well, I can attest to the Xavier Nady margarita, having spent two years with him in Arizona. It, it is phenomenal and got me through yeah. uh, some serious issues over there. But uh, I'm drinking local. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a spindle tap brewery, and what's great is they kind of pay homage to uh, Houston sports. So I am drinking a beer called Hopkeem. Nice. I like it. I Love like that. that. Love Hopkeem. Yep. Awesome. I'm going to also, buddy, like you, I'm going uh, local, but with modern times for today. Delicious IP. It's fantastic. Love our local breweries. San Diego, it's, it's the best in the world. It's great. It's great. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers to everyone. Cheers, Thank everyone. You Cheers. Cheers, guys. Good to see you, guys. Good to see you all again. Blummer, really good to see you. Good to see you, Blummer. Good to see you, Blummer.
No, I miss you guys like crazy. Marty, you have no good idea. To you too, Marty. Thanks, yeah, hey, Marty. Marty. Thanks, you guys. Miss you guys in the dugout. Miss the dugout stories, but this is a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Let's do it again. You got right, it, Martha. Guys, Marty. Great idea, Marty. Okay. Thank you. Martha.